it's typically about 30 minutes. I've distilled it down to 15 with a very quick intro to anyone who, I don't know the audience if, if you guys use, I know a lot of you use BGP quite a lot. I don't know if all of you use BGP quite a lot. So what I've done is uh, just, just the, the four key points that we need to know to be able to talk about large communities. The first thing is what an AS is, an autonomous system. Essentially, it's just a network. Aircom is an AS, Google is an AS. When we're talking about routing in BGP, we represent ASs with a number, an AS number. This is typically just a 16-bit number. It used to be a 16-bit number. And as an example, INEX's AS is 2128. About 10 years ago, we realized that 65,000 wasn't enough for the growing internet, and we introduced 32-bit AS numbers. So now we have uh, upwards of about 4 billion. Uh, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, is how networks share routing and reachability information. So if Aircom and Google, for example, want to peer with each other over BGP, that will allow uh, Aircom to signal to Google that certain uh, ranges of IP addresses are reachable on their network. So they'd advertise the addresses that they use for their customers, for example, which tells Google how to transit that traffic to them. And then the, the bit that we hear tonight for BGP communities is extra bit of information that we can attach to these prefixes. So we call it tagging. We can tag these routes or these prefixes with extra information that can uh, allow us to uh, filter routes or, or, or take certain actions, uh, as we've seen in a little while. Uh, this is uh, a show IP BGP command from uh, Google's Edge router for our management network. Uh, and what we're particularly seeing here is that uh, this route that we've learned from an AS13237, which is a ISP called EU Networks, uh, we've learned that and they've tagged that uh, with, with uh, three communities, or it's tagged at least with three communities. So these are the, the communities that, are in th that, that were defined over 20 years ago in RFC 1997. Uh, and as I said, they, they were designed to simplify internet routing policies. They can be informative, as we'll see in a second, and they can also be used to signal a particular action, as we'll also see. Uh, the one thing about these communities is that they are strictly a 32-bit uh, value. Uh, and we normally represent them textually or visually as two 16-bit numbers, which you can see in the example there. So if we just dive into one of them, let's take this uh, 13237 colon 45049. The first one is, is typically an AS number. It's normally the origin AS or a target AS, but it's normally an AS number representing someone's network. The second bit will either be informative or signal an action. In this case, uh, anyone who is, is tagging their routes will norm normally publish what these tags mean on some internet routing registry. So EU networks have published this information. And what we can see about this particular route is that it's it, the 450 indicates that it, that it means that EU networks have learned this from one of their customers over BGP. So it's a route that they've learned from one of their customers. And furthermore, with the 49, we can see that they've learned this from a customer in Germany. So that's what information they're telling us. We can use that ourselves to filter out routes that we don't want. So if we're in Ireland and we only want to use EU networks to send our traffic to Irish, uh, Irish networks only, we can filter out everyone but any routes that have been tagged ending in 3.5 for Ireland. The second use is uh, for signaling some action. So if we were a customer of EU networks, uh, and if we were pretty crazy, we may decide that we don't want our routes advertised at INEX, for example. And what we would do in that case is we tag our routes uh, as we send them with uh, 3802, and then some value N, where N0 means don't advertise that route at INEX. So if we're a customer of EU Networks, we don't want our routes exchanged at INEX, we would tag our routes, and EU Networks wouldn't uh, propagate them to, to uh, INEX's root servers and members. So uh, bringing us on to large BGP communities uh, and why we need them, uh, you may have ascertained the problem already, which is that Traditionally, we have, or in the past, AS numbers were limited to 16 bits, and BGP communities are strictly a 32-bit value, and a community is made up of a origin or target network with some action. Uh, and when we extend that to 32-bit AS numbers, we simply can't squeeze 64 bits into 32 bits. Uh, so you might say, how much of a problem is this on the internet? What this table is, is, is showing you, this was uh, accurate as of yesterday. 
is that of AS numbers visible on the internet routing table, 20% are 32-bit ASNs now. So it's, it's a problem that's been growing. Uh, and, and solving this problem has been uh, a continuing process over 10 years uh, in, in the IETF to create a new RFC to solve this. I'm not going to go into the history of that, but the problem with the IETF, if anyone's involved in it, is things can get complicated. Uh, you can end up bike shedding. You can try and solve too many problems at once, and you can end up getting nowhere. And, and that's what has happened uh, heretofore with, with trying to solve this. From Onyx's own perspective, uh, a quick search of our database tells me that we have 13 members of our 90 at INEX that have 32-bit AS numbers. Uh, that should actually be higher, but INEX took an active decision uh, years ago where anyone who joined INEX, uh, typically regional ISPs that had never been a member of RIPE and never had an AS number, when they came to us with their brand new flashy 32-bit ASN, we'd always advise them to go back to RIPE and demand a 16-bit ASN because 32-bit ASNs just don't support communities, or communities don't support them. So uh, I'd say that should have been 20% if we hadn't been pushing members back to get 16-bit ASNs over the years. So how is this a problem operationally? Well, uh, Onyx is an internet exchange point, and what we do is we facilitate multilateral peering, peering sessions. What that means is you can join Onyx with one big fat cable and peer with about 90 other networks rather than having to get a cable to each of those networks individually. Uh, so that solves a scaling problem, but it presents a new challenge. Uh, and that new challenge is, if we have 90 members, and if each of those members want to peer at everybody else, that comes to about 88,000 BGP sessions. You don't measure the effort in creating that in man hours or man days, but rather man years, because every session is normally an email exchange or a telephone call, where you need two engineers at each end to configure a router. Uh, so IXPs have created root servers to solve this problem, and root servers are analogous to uh, root reflectors in, in, within a larger network. Uh, so root servers are the external form of root reflectors. They're semantically a bit different, but the principle is pretty much the same, which is that it takes us from the graph on the left, where everyone peers at everybody else, to the graph on the right, where uh, you just peer with a pair of resilient root servers. And what they do is you advertise your roots to those, and they will mirror those routes to everybody else. Your traffic doesn't flow through them. Your traffic still flows directly from one, one member to the other directly between their routers uh, over the peering platform. They don't route the traffic. They just share the information. Uh, but what they do is they introduce a new problem, uh, a network policy problem. So if, if Aircom peered directly with Google over INEX, and let's say Aircom's uh, pipes were getting a bit full, and they said, you know what, we might take 10 or 20% off these pipes if we take away a block of routes that we advertise to Google as a large supplier of traffic to us. The problem with route servers is if you take away those routes from Google, you're going to take them away from everybody else as well. So to solve that problem, IXPs created this well-known set of communities. Uh, and in, in these particular examples of the communities, 43760 is the community for INEX's root server. And what these communities allow us to do is say, advertise our routes to every member of the exchange except a certain amount, or advertise them to nobody but a certain amount. So we get to control in per route, per prefix, how the INEX root servers advertise those routes. The problem is that members of the 32-bit ASN cannot be filtered by anyone else because you just can't use a 32-bit ASN in these, in these communities. It also means that those members with 32-bit ASNs cannot filter anybody else with a 32-bit ASN. So the solution is RFC 8092. Uh, and you can see in the list of authors there, our own Nick Hilliard is one of the authors. But I think it's fair to say that the primary driver of this is a guy called Job Schneider from NTT. Uh, and it was, it was more out of desperation 10 years, this, this problem has been knocking around IETF without solution. Uh, Yob, with pitchfork in hand, basically said, let's just make this really simple. We want communities that support ASN32, so let's just make them bigger. We don't need to bike shed it. We don't need to go into lots of details. We don't need to look at extended attributes. Let's just make this bigger. And that's pretty much all this does. Uh, the, the main difference is that uh, rather than going from 32 to 64 bits, we've gone from 32 to 96 bits. 
Uh, and that allows us to solve one other major problem that we had with BGP communities in the past, which was you had an origin or a target with some action. Now we get to maintain origin, target, and action. So we have three, uh, three sets of numbers. Uh, and you can see how easy this is. If you look at how our uh, standard communities are, the ones I showed you earlier on, they just translate in large communities to, uh, to this. Uh, so you can see that we've maintained INEX's ASN in all the communities this time. Our action is really, really simple. Zero, do not announce, one, announce. And then you set a target AS or zero for all peers. Um, just the last couple of slides. I, this, uh, if you're interested in it, this went from proposal to standardization in less than six months, which is, I think is one of the fastest RFC progressions through the IETF, mostly because it was demanded by the operators and it was kept pretty simple. Uh, also, uh, you might be able to read this, but this is a list of BGP routing software or BGP or routers that speak BGP that now implement large communities. Uh, and one of the great things here, you'll see uh, Cisco iOS XOR is implemented in beta, so that's making its way through to production. Juniper, it's in progress, uh, and a number of other uh, servers. For example, INEX's root servers run on Bird that was implemented a few months ago. One of the critical things that got this through ITF so quickly was that Yob uh, and the guys were able to come uh, as part of the process and say this is already proof of concept being implemented in a number of open source uh, routing engines. In terms of our tool, tool stack, uh, pretty much most of the tools that we'd use commonly every day in analyzing this traffic, things like TCP dump and Wireshark already all support and read BGP large communities. Uh, if any of you have access to an edge or transit router and you can see the, the, the fault free zone, the full BGP routing table on the internet, there is a V4 and a V6 beacon prefix that is tagged with large communities. Uh, what you'll see on the right of that, uh, on the top, is Cisco IOS that doesn't support large communities. You'll see in the red text, it'll come up as an unknown transitive attribute. So you can actually make out in the, uh, in the uh, hex values, you can actually see the three, uh, the three, the three AS, uh, or sorry, the three 32-bit uh, values are in there. The bottom one is BIRD, which supports large BGP communities. And you can see the old communities on the second last line. Then you can see the large community on the last line. Um, the other point of note for INEX is that we were the first network to deploy this in production. So uh, at, at early last November, we run two root servers. Uh, we upgraded one of them to support uh, the latest version of Bird 163, which, is, which supports large communities. And we've ran that without issue for the last nearly six months. Uh, what we typically do in this situation is we wait until there's a slightly wider adoption before we upgrade the second one, just to make sure that if there is an issue, it won't affect both of our root servers. Uh, and that's it for me, folks. If you want to know more about large communities, the website is there. Uh, it contains some of the information I've given already, uh, and my own contact details are there as well, if you have any questions. No, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, that is, sorry, so you, you were asking about the uh, BGP community tagging that EU networks were using from here. Yeah. That, that is something that every operator will do independently. So that's not actually standardization. If, if you peer with EU networks, uh, this is a directory of the communities they use. Every network will make up their own communities. So it's, it's not a standard. Okay, thanks so many folks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please settle down and sacrifice the chicken to the demo gods because here's Kosti telling us, showing us actually, hopefully, that open flow is not dead. Hello, everybody. Um, so, Hello, my name is Kosti Sherban. Um, I'm a network engineer working in Google. And today I'm going to uh, make a demonstration uh, about uh, uh, OpenFlow and SDN using an SDN controller. It's a pain to. Can I 
speak like this? Can you hear me? Okay. So I don't have to stay here. So today uh, I'll try to make a demonstration regarding OpenFlow uh, using an SDN controller called Fawcett. Um, and uh, before I start, I would like to state that uh, any opinions expressed in this uh, demonstration or during the, the presentation are my own uh, and not uh, uh, Google, does not represent Google. So uh, I'll start with a, a small introduction about Fawcett. Fawcett is an open source controller written by um, uh, New Zealand Research and Advanced Network, Rian NZ. Uh, it's written based on uh, Ryu framework. Actually, it's a Ryu application. So in order to run Fawcett, you will invoke the Ryu manager uh, command. And it, it has a continuous uh, increasing number of uh, features, such as uh, uh, configurable flood modes, Mac learning, VLAN, uh, ACL, static routing, and, and so on. So you can check on their uh, blog to understand uh, what, uh, what this controller does. Besides this, it's uh, good to notice that um, uh, it's written in Python because it's, it's based on Ryu. And not only this, it follows Python style guides. And besides this, it uh, contains a comprehensive test suit uh, that could be run against uh, uh, both virtual network topologies and physical hardware. So from time to time, I have to refresh my, my, my mobile because this morning when I came here to test my topology, I realized that there's no cable here. So I'm actually tethering from my, from my, from my mobile. So the entire demonstration uh, is based on my mobile tethering. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so that's why from time to time I, I have to do this. Um, as I said, oops, as I said, it runs also against physical hardware. And here uh, there are already some uh, support for it from some vendors. You have them listed there. there. And besides this, of course, it works with the software uh, switches such as OpenV switch and Lagopus. Now, what is the target of this demo? Uh, first of all, I want to demonstrate that we can have an SDN controller that is able to manage both physical and uh, virtual switches. Uh, second, I want to, to show how we can leverage Linux kernel and um, uh, Linux applications to offload traditional network functions uh, from dedicated uh, boxes into virtual Linux container. So that NFV, uh, network function virtualizations. Also, I'm going to use OpenFlow and in particular OpenFlow version 1.3 that contains multi-table support is the feature that gives OpenFlow a lot of flexibility uh, and scalability. But on the flip side is the feature that vendors have a lot of problems to, to uh, uh, make it work in, in hardware. But this is what we want. We want scalability and flexibility. So Fawcett works only with OpenFlow 1.3 that has multi-table support. Besides this, I want to demonstrate a couple of uh, Fawcett features such as uh, policy-based routing, port mirroring, ACL, and so on. And last but not least, uh, I won't have time to, to do the, that last demonstration, but uh, uh, what I wanted to do, but there's no time for it, what I wanted to do is to create the entire physical setup in, um, in, um, uh, virtu as a virtual, and you can run the same tests in a virtual environment. So basically, before you go, to, to launch something in production, you can test your policies, you can test your, um, your changes in a virtualized, uh, on a virtualized network, uh, so-called in software engineer push on green. So this is the uh, setup. 
the central piece of the setup is this uh, switch. It's uh, called Zodiac FX switch. Uh, it claims to be the world's smallest open flow uh, switch and card size, I believe it is the smallest. Um, besides this, I have a couple of Raspberry Pis connected here in a mess, but because it's hard to, to track the mess, I took a picture without cables and put it here. So um, we have this black case Raspberry Pi on top that runs faucet. We have this uh, white case uh, Raspberry Pi that runs an uh, NV, uh, NFV server. And we have this transparent uh, case uh, Raspberry Pi that is like a, like a user. So the the goal of the target the goal of this demonstration would be to uh, be able from a user to get an IP address and to browse the internet. That ETH2 that connects to internet is actually my my mobile tethering USB. Uh, before I, I start the demonstration, I want to say a couple of things about the NFV server. It looks like the most complicated piece of the uh, demonstration. So those uh, light blue boxes, uh, DACP, not IDS, are network namespaces. So I want to provide network functions inside uh, isolated containers. And I'm running these network namespaces to do that. Then in order to connect all these network namespaces, I'm using an uh, OpenV switch, uh, switch, an obvious switch, and uh, the actual links, the dotted lines are virtual Ethernet uh, interfaces, so VETH interfaces. Um, basically, what I'm expecting when the user connects to the inter to the uh, to the switch, uh, all the ACP. Uh, all the ACP requests will be sent to that specialized um, uh, DACP NFV. And this is controlled by Fawcett. So Fawcett has the entire configuration in a YAML file. And as you can see here, I have some access list, very simple access list, that catches in particular um, DACP and forwards it on port 2. If I go back, port two is actually this port here. Uh, it takes some time. Uh, that goes to DACP. And I have another rule that says anything else, mirror it on port four. So basically, on port four, I have the IDS. So what I want, I want the IDS to be able to see all the traffic between the user and internet and back. So these are only two rules. Uh, you don't have, Fawcett is, is, is more complex. So Fawcett has about eight tables, uh, something like this, but it does everything, everything for you. So it's, it's like a production ready switch. So you can take it and, and put it in production and act as a switch. What I have here with the ACLs are extra thing, things that I want my setup to do. So, uh, let's see. My ping still runs. I'm going to stop this. So I'm going to disconnect. Um, I need three hands. So. Here on the on this window that scrolls right now, on the uh, top left, it's actually uh, I'm doing tail F for faucet logs. So I actually disconnected both the user and I also disconnected the switch from the controller. So at this moment, the switch and the controller are not connected. So I'm tailing.
I'm, I'm tailing this log in order to see how the switch connects to the controller. Here on this window, I actually have uh, uh, tailing the DNS mask log. So where I want to see that indeed all the, um, um, stop doing pictures. <laughs> all the DACP requests actually reaches my DACP uh, NFV. And on the bottom, I actually run this command, IP net network namespace exe execute TCP dump inside that IDS network namespace. I want, as, as you saw in the faucet, basically IDS uh, namespace should be able to see everything. So I'm doing a TCP dump on, on that interface, hopefully being able to see something. So at this moment, what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect the switch to the controller. So please watch the top left window. So as you can see there, the switch immediately discovered uh, the controller, it got connected, it pushed configuration, and and yeah, it's, it's here. Now, hopefully, I'm moving to the Raspberry Pi test. As you can see on ET, ET, ETH0 has no, no, um, IP. I'm going to connect this host as well. So if I try to ping now, that's, that's not, it can't reach the internet, right? So I'm going to connect the host and I'm going to move here to be able to see the um, DACP reaching uh, DACP NAV. Uh, I've got here on faucet log saying that, hey, I have learned this uh, new source address on that host, on that port and so on. I got here on DNS logs, on the ACP logs, uh, all the request and the reply. As you can see here on the IDS, he sees a lot of traffic going back and forth. And if I move to, if I move to the test host, and I'm doing an IF config. I got an IP 10, zero something, and I'm going to ping my favorite website. And I should be able to see this also in the, uh, yeah, in the IDS uh, net uh, container. Uh, something else that I would like to, to show you. Two minutes, okay. Uh, rules of the obvious switch so that you, Maybe some of you already played with the OVS and may say, ah, you have a rule take from port one to send it to port two and it works. No, it's not like this. So I'm going to run a command to show the, the flows on the OVS switch, flows that are installed by faucet. So that's, that's the OVS switch. And I have a bunch of flows here. I can actually take the MAC address or the IP address and grab it through the, through the flows and so on. So I don't have too much time for, for that. What? Uh, my last slide uh, is where you can find some more, uh, more information. There's a, I, I, I wrote an article that describes the entire steps, how to set up this. And you don't necessarily have to have these uh, Raspberry Pis and Open and Zodiac switch. Uh, at the end of that article, there's, uh, there's a script that I created. Uh, you run it and it uses Mininet to create uh, the entire topology virtualized. Switches, uh, NFV, uh, controller, everything virtualized. So you can run the same test uh, virtualized. Uh, last but not uh, least, RIAN NZ uh, GitHub 
and faucet blog links are uh, in the demonstration. Uh, 0015, who? Questions? And by the way, if I manage not to, to break any cables to move the, the, to move the table back, at the end, you can come to me and we can do some cool stuff. Questions? I believe you have too many questions, right? Yeah, but they can't be public. So. This, is the, this is the switch. <laughs> Card size, Raspberry Pi, everything, yeah? So as Costa said, you can find them and hopefully we'll, we'll move the whole crazy lab down there without pushing and unplugging anything. So if you want to, to see more of that, just uh, go to him after, after the last talk with a beer in hand. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Thank you, Kosti. Thank you. OK, that's working. Great. OK, hi, I'm Laura. And I'm going to talk about SRE. Um, so what is SRE? Probably is a whole bunch. So what is SRE? Hopefully, like a bunch of you don't actually know. Hands up here who knows what SRE is. OK, like maybe 50% of you or more have heard of this. OK. So um, I'm going to ex first explain the terrible, terrible joke on my title slide. Um, so here in Google, everyone is required to have a three-letter description of our mission. So um, this time I have chosen system reticulation engineering. So reticulation is like a, another word for a network. These are reticulated giraffes. Um, and I was in Kenya over Christmas, so you know I just sort of enjoyed that visual. So about me. So um, I'm not like most of you guys. I'm really sorry. Um, so I came from a CS background and I was a software engineer for years and uh, I, I specialized in a while particularly in software performance which is basically you hammer the hell out of things with load tests and then you, you fix the, the threading problems and things that you find. Um, then four years ago I joined Google. Um, Niall Murphy was here a few minutes ago. Was he still here? He was my first boss here and then I, earlier today he came up to me and he kind of went, I don't really see how you apply SRE to, to networking and um, it's a shame that he left because this would totally partly answer his question. Um, so I worked on kind of big data systems here at Google for a while and uh, then about a year ago they said, hey Laura, we, we would really like to have some SREs working on the network. And I kind of went, oh dear God, why would I want to do that? I don't know anything about networking. And then poor Plamen over there at the back, he has had the, uh, the task of being my mentor in networking, so thank you. Um, for part of the rest of the year, I'm going to be doing a CCNP. So here we are. Um, but, you know, at, in terms of things that I'm good at, SRE is one of those things. I wrote one of the chapters of the O'Reilly SRE book that came out last year and was a runaway bestseller. And I'm co-chair of the Using Accessory Con MIA conference, which will be happening here in Dublin in August. So, SRE. Um, this couple of sentences sums up SRE as, as well as anything else I could find. Um, so, hope is not a strategy. And uh, obviously that comes from a very um, well-known military quotation. But engineering solutions to design build and run large-scale systems scalably, reliably, and efficiently is a strategy, apparently, and a good one. So SRE is kind of about bringing a mindset to production engineering. So we don't just want to sort of take things day by day and stick duct tape on things. We want to be planning for the future. We want to be sort of finding problems in our systems. We want to be, um, every time something breaks, doing engineering to fix it. Um, we want to be scaling the effort that we put into running our systems at a, a short, at a slower rate than um, than the growth of our system. So if I if I have 50% more routers next year, I don't want to spend 50% more time maintaining them because eventually you run out of people, right? So that's SRE. There are lots of misconceptions about SRE, and I couldn't fit them all on one slide with a picture. So you know I just picked three because apparently they say that three is a good number of things to have on your slide. So SRE is a fancy title for your operations team. Uh, no. SREs expect to have a lot more kind of, let's call it authority. Like we expect to be able to say, no, your design sucks and we will not support that. Um, if you can't do that, you're, you know, you're not really operating as an SRE team. 
we, um, we expect to have input into designs, into choosing um, SLOs, into all sorts of things like this. SRE is also not entirely about automating common tasks. So I kind of joined the networking SRE team here and everyone went, great, Laura's going to automate everything. Um, you know, okay, we do some automation, but we are not automation engineers because if we were, that would be what we would, what we would be called, not SREs, right? So we do some automation, but we do a lot of other things as well. Um, SRE is also not a silver bullet for your operational issues. If you have an overloaded operations team and you say, hey, you're all SREs now, nothing will change. What you actually have to do is you have to give them power to say no to things. Um, you have to make sure that they are empowered to say, okay, these pages and, and these alerts that we're getting and we're spending all this time on, you know, these are not important. This engineering work that will help us to scale ourselves out of this work, this is important. You know, SRE teams need, they need authority to choose their own work, choose what's important and what's not. Um, there's, the other big misconception is that SREs are just about saying no. Um, this is also not true. We're about saying yes, but, or, you know, yes, and we'll fix the monitoring first, you know, that kind of thing. So, so the core functions of SRE, and these are according to Ben Trainer, who is the man who basically invented SRE in Google. They are monitoring and metrics. So um, we certainly have lots of that in the network. Um, they're about emergency response. So, you know, dealing with, dealing with it when something breaks in a, in a user visible kind of way. Capacity planning, again, something that we do in networking. Service turn up and turn down. So, you know, in, in SRE terms, this is generally, you know, we're going to turn up an instance of, uh, you know, some well-known Google system like Bigtable in a new cell. In, in network terms, we have this as well, but, you know, maybe we're turning up, you know, our first router in a new pop something like that. We're turning up the, the networking for a new cluster. Um, and then there's performance and efficiency, which again, you know, certainly exists as concerns in the network. So um, one thing I'm just going to allude to here quickly before I talk about the six functions of SRE. Software-defined networking is, is happening, right? So the traditional bailiwick of SRE, it was invented for running distributed systems complicated systems that talk to each other over unreliable networking links, and we all know how unreliable those are, um, and that need to behave gracefully when parts of them break. That's the essence of SRE, and everything we do around that is, is just about, those are the techniques that we use to make those systems reliable in the face of being half broken all the time, because all systems are partly broken all the time, if they're in any way complicated. So SDN, um, I'm, yeah, so who here is really kind of aware of software-defined networking? So yeah, okay, some people. Less than SRE, wow. Okay, so software-defined networking, the whole idea is instead of, um, instead of all the smarts being like on your networking devices, each router, each switch making its own independent decisions about the world and routing traffic as it sees fit based on its own inputs, that's traditional IP networking, right? Um, SDN is more like, I have some software that's somewhere in a data center that's gathering all this information and it's making a whole bunch of decisions and pushing them out to the networking devices, which are relatively dumb. And the whole reason that you do this is because it helps you scale your networks more efficiently, make better use of your infrastructure. Um, but it, it brings in all these extra failure modes because suddenly your smarts are not on your machines anymore. Now suddenly your controllers can go down and you have to make them reliable and you have to monitor them and all these things. And they can have software bugs. And I mean, certainly the, the software running on our networking devices can have software bugs as well. But, you know, um, when, it's your, when it's your one single controller that's, or you're one of your N controllers that are controlling your system, that's more catastrophic. So software-defined networking is kind of the joker in the deck. And that's going to you know, it's relatively early days yet, but it's going to be something that will change the way that we think about running networks in the future. And I think it's going to make anyone who's, large, re, who's running a large network have to sort of think about distributed systems reliability for software systems in ways that maybe network engineers have not been thinking about. So that's purely an aside. So back to the SRE core, core functions. So monitoring and metrics. Like I say, we have these in networks as well. I'm sure everyone, I mean, we had a monitoring talk just there a few minutes ago. I'm sure everybody is monitoring their networks in some ways. Um, the way we do monitoring, though, is there are specific SRE concerns around this. So 
one of the things we like to do as SREs is we like to base our monitoring on our service level objectives. So our service level objectives are things in a software system we would say we want to have 99.99% availability. So we want that, met that percentage of user requests that are well formed to be served without error. And we want to do it in a latency of 100 milliseconds um, at the 90th percentile. That would be an example of an SLO. It's really hard to define good network SLOs is something that we've found. And the reason that it's hard is because it's hard to figure out what is the user impact of you know, another five milliseconds of, of uh, latency on a particular link because you, you don't know what impact that's having on what somebody is doing between your servers and the world. Um, you know, particularly if it's you know, somewhere on your backbone. Um, so you, you're losing some traffic. What impact is that having? You know, are people just resetting connections and trying again? You know, how, how much latency is that adding to your users? It's really hard to figure out what actually matters. So I, I think one of the things that we tend to do is say that everything matters. Um, we alert um, based on, you know, things that can be, that can be quite small. Um, we also tend to, because we can't really see the impact on users, we tend to alert on causes. So, you know, we see a link is flapping. So even, even if it's not really impacting anybody, we will page on that and somebody will get up and fix it. Something that we have, um, at least I observed about the networking world in Google is, you know, the lack of trust in your alerting. So one of the SRE principles is you, you can't have somebody sitting there watching your graphs all the time or, you know, kind of manually sort of checking things. Um, you've got to have alerting rules that that you, you trust, that are automated, that you know that if something really bad does happen to your service, you're going to get told about it by your alerting. Every alert you get should be actionable. So, you know, for example, you don't want to be alerted about some transient error that goes away in two minutes. You don't want to be alerted about something that might or might not be an issue. It's okay to have those things sort of go off to a log somewhere as information, but you know you shouldn't actually be bothering an engineer about that because that just wastes people's time and means you don't have time to do important things. One of the things we also believe in in SRE is we do long-term analysis of our metrics. So in a software service, we might look at um, we look at our latency over quarter by quarter for the past couple of years. So that means that we know if we're getting slower and slower on average. So you know we don't want things to sort of creep. You know, a few milliseconds here, a few milliseconds there, and suddenly, you know, you're slower than your users want to be. Um, but, so as well as metrics about your service, it's also really important to track metrics about your team. So how many bugs are being opened? You know, are you closing them in, in good time? Or are they sort of hanging around, sort of being an enormous bug queue that your people are toiling on? Are you getting paged too much? You know, if you're getting paged eight times a day for different issues, you know, you don't have time to, to deal with all that, to do postmortems, to do proper engineering work. So those are some, some kind of important things that we do with our metrics as SREs. So emergency response techniques. Um, so what we did in SRE in Google is we stole these from the likes of sort of large emergency services. So in particular, I think the, um, the emergency services in the US that deal with things like forest fires. So in a large incident that where you might, it might be kind of you, you might be dealing with, you know, peers or infrastructure providers, you might be dealing with, um, you know, software administrators, um, people who are running the software that's using your network. Um, you can very often end up with a whole bunch of people working together to try and resolve an incident. So we have specific techniques that are good for doing this, you know, making sure that people have defined roles. So somebody is in charge of the overall incident. So they're tracking that, Everyone is sort of pulling in the right direction together. Um, we'll have somebody in charge of operations. So somebody who is in charge of figuring out, you know, how do we mitigate this right now? How, how, do, we, how do we root cause it? You know, you have three possible root causes, you know, de delegate different people to do different things. Are you doing communication with your users? The incident, the incident management techniques that we use deal with all these things. And incident management techniques can be the difference between a really bad problem in your system being resolved in maybe 20 minutes versus hours or days. Um, they're really, really important. And if anybody sort of, um, I don't know, I think the, a large recent high profile incident was Instapaper. Did anyone else see that? Nobody else, okay. So Instapaper is like a bookmarking service and they had a really horrible outage a couple of weeks back where what happened was their production database was MySQL on Amazon and it grew to two terabytes and then it couldn't grow anymore. 
So um, their backups were also completely useless because they were also two terabytes and their production database couldn't be used because it was, it was over, the, over the size. So um, they publicly wrote about their response to this and they didn't use good incident management techniques. And they figured that their outage was probably, you know, maybe a day or so longer than it had to be. It was a really long outage. So once your outage is over, um, SRE have a big thing about blame-free postmortems. And again, we stole this. We stole this from, you know, likes of the aviation industry and kind of chemical engineers and from, uh, you know, healthcare as well. So we're very interested in getting to the root causes of problems and, and to things that we can do engineering-wise to prevent them happening again. So, you know, it won't just be, you know, hey, this thing went down because the server crashed, you know, we'll, we'll bring the server back up. You know, we'll kind of go, okay, you know, why was it designed this way that, that we had a single point of failure? How can, we, how can we fix it so that we don't anymore? You know, how can, we, how can we monitor it to make sure that we don't ever have a single point of failure again? You know, um, maybe even looking at kind of process failures, you know, um, why did the team that designed this not get SRE review? That kind of thing. So disaster planning and testing is a big SRE thing. So in Google, we do an annual thing called DIRT. So that's a week where we basically sort of go around breaking our own systems, um, or at least trying to break our systems to see what they will do. Now, it's not as chaotic as all that. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of risk and analysis. We don't do things that we think will really break us. But we do do things that are scary. So um, again, I don't know if anybody followed the big Amazon S3 outage that was happening over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, OK. So it seems like one of their big root causes there was it was really scary for them to restart an S3 cluster um, if it was a large one. And so they haven't done it in a number of years. So it took a lot longer than they thought. So a typical Google thing would be to, to test that, that sort of thing as part of DIRT. Um, Wheel of Misfortune is a classical um, SRE thing that we do. So Wheel of Misfortune is a training thing. Um, what we do is we get together as a team. And uh, these guys at the back know what I'm talking about because I've been making them do it for the last year. Um, so what you do is somebody, <laughs> there you are. So somebody is gonna be the dungeon master effectively. They come up with a, an on-call type scenario. Um, and then they'll say, okay, so you're, they'll, they'll pick a victim or you know, a, a, a lucky volunteer. And they will say, hey, lucky volunteer, you're on call and you've got this page. And then you go through all the steps of um, trying to figure out what's going on based on your monitoring, based on your playbooks, um, trying to mitigate it, trying to root cause it. So it's a really good way for people who are new to a system to learn about it. It's a good way to practice your, your incident management skills, and it's a good way to practice your troubleshooting skills. And it can also be very useful um, in a, you know, you're, it's a less pressured situation than you're typically in, so it's very good to exercise things like your consoles and your debugging tools in these kinds of scenarios where you're not actually under the gun of something really being broken. Um, SREs are also, we're also very big on having playbooks that describe processes to follow when something is broken, um, usually for, for help in figuring out, is it really an issue? How can I mitigate this quickly? How can, how can I root cause it? And uh, troubleshooting and debugging skills are a traditional SRE thing. And also, has to be said, a traditional network engineering thing. Um, my, 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 my colleagues in network SRE are very much better than me at this, and I'm learning all sorts of things. So thank you. <clears throat> so capacity planning. So this is all about understanding how your system works in terms of is this much load. Um, we, need, we need this much infrastructure to, to actually serve that load. So every system is different. If you're doing this for running Bigtable, it's gonna be different to doing this for running another software system, and it's gonna be different to doing this for running a network. But, at the very, but nonetheless, if you're running a large network with, that's carrying a lot of traffic, you need to do capacity planning. Um, so you gather your long-term metrics about how much load you're actually um, carrying on different parts of your network. One of the most complex things, and usually you need software to do this, is to understand how does failure in one part of your system affect the demand for capacity elsewhere. So, you know, if I augment this link here by, you know, 100 gigs and then later on it goes down, is it going to swamp this small link over here? Um, you know, so these are things that you have to consider. So these are kind of traditional SRE strengths. We do these for our software systems and it's not too much different doing this for your network. Really interesting things about capacity planning. Organic growth 
Um, so this is where you're growing maybe 5% a quarter or 10% a year. You can plan for that relatively easy. Launches are terrifying. Um, you know, somebody is launching, you know, like say a new music streaming system in, in a place where you don't have a ton of bandwidth, that's a scary thing. And you have to kind of go and figure out what's going to be the demand for that service. Can we carry that? It's even more fun when you're trying to do this for, for something that's running in a cloud, because then you have to worry about your customers' launches, where you may not have so much visibility. And um, I'm certainly not going to mention any of these that have gone wrong, but there was a high profile one about a year ago. So service turn up and turn down. This is a very SRE thing. So like I say, typically in an SRE world, we're talking about turning up a new software stack. So something like Bigtable. Um, a lot of a lot of um, Google production systems would consist of dozens or maybe a couple of hundred different pieces of software and configuration that have to work together to make this system run. And turning these up in the right order is uh, is non-trivial. Like maybe you need to copy in a bunch of data from somebody else as well, somewhere else. Um, you know, turning up um, a whole bunch of new networking stuff is no different. Um, one interesting wrinkle that we've noticed in networking is that turning new things up can be quite dangerous. So in particular, turning up peering links can make, can sometimes if you're, you know, somebody had a lovely talk about BGP earlier, but you know, BG, BGP is horrendous. I mean, this is my biggest revelation since joining, since working on the network. I mean, God, I can't believe the internet runs on it. But anyway, um, you know, <laughs> seriously, I, I submitted a talk to another conference for, um, for me, and I think I called it the internet is held together with duct tape. It's crazy, but this is a total aside. But you know, if you if you if you turn something up and and you get your BGP configurations wrong, I mean, you you could have God knows how much traffic trying to get down one link, and you know that's going to affect you, and this could also adversely affect your peers as well. So you know, in the network, there's actually quite a lot of danger associated with with doing this. You got to be able to decommission your old stuff. Um, and like I say, in a, in a software-defined networking world, or a world in which we have a bunch of automation around and monitoring and all these sorts of things around our network, we've got to think about turning up and turning down our software as well, safely. So change management. So obviously, turning up and turning down things is sort of one form of change management, but there's lots of others. So change management is kind of everything. I mean, you, you're, it's, it's a new release of some software. It's uh, it's, an, it's introducing new devices to your network. It's, um, it's turning things up or draining things as part of your maintenance. Um, if there's one thing that breaks your distributed systems and takes them down, it tends to be changing something. And we, we've done research on this in Google and it's well known. So you change stuff and you've got a pretty high risk of breaking yourself at some point. But you have to change something. I mean, you have to, you know, upgrade your devices, you know, physically and software. You have you have to change your configuration as your network changes. Um, so tip, this is something again that's kind of harder in the network. So in software, you know, we're running this, we're running our service in, you know, 20 different places, 20 completely independent data centers. You upgrade one first, and you see if it breaks horribly, and you know if it doesn't then that's great. But sometimes in the network, you have things that were, you know, like I say, you, you, if, you're, if you're turning up, say, one link somewhere, you just got to turn it up. Like, you can't sort of, you know, test it, and turn it up in testing mode. You know, it's just got to be done. Um, you can canary some things. I mean, if you're going to, so canarying is when you, up, when you update one part of your system first, and you watch it for a while to make sure that it's OK. You know, that, that's canarying. So you can do this with, say, your software versions. Um, somebody before talked about um, INEX doing this with your root servers. You do one first, and then you wait a while before you do the second one, just in case. Um, but you can't always do this with your configurations, um, because sometimes it's something that has to be kind of deployed everywhere, or it's something that's sort of global in nature, because it's going to it's going to be a configuration that's going to propagate through the whole network. Um, you know, routing is like that. It's all connected. It all propagates. So networks are kind of more dangerous to change than software systems because in software, we, we go out of our way to try and reduce the number of points that our software systems interact with other parts of, of themselves, right? And we're not always very successful at it, but I think we tend to have an order of magnitude fewer touching control planes in our software systems than we do in our networks. And that's a really scary thing. 
So change management in networks is a really big challenge to kind of SRE philosophy. So um, one of the things that we do say is that wherever it's possible to canary something, you should canary it. So, you know, certainly software version changes and config changes wherever it's feasible to do so. And we also strongly think that it's best to have most of your changes done by automation. It's best to, to write tests for them as much as possible. So, you know, write tests to make sure that your BGP configs are sane before you push them. You know, it's better to have a robot do the check and catch a human error than to break something. Um, so, yeah, and again, automation. Um, you know, it's possible that your automation will go haywire. Um, we have to build in all sorts of checks about this. So, you know, for example, you might have automation that goes through your network and notices, notices problems like links that are erroring and drains them. You want to put some rate limiting on that automation to make sure that it doesn't decide that everything is erroring and, just, and drain your whole network. Um, so automation safety is, automation is better than humans touching things because humans will inevitably leave things in bad inconsistent states. They're going to inevitably break things accidentally, but your automation can also break things, so you've got to be careful with your automation. So uh, performance and efficiency. Um, so obviously, I mean, this this is a concern in networks as well. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of things that people do when they're designing network topologies is all about trying to make your network scale scale better. You know, how how do we how do we service a data center that's you know twice as big as it was last year? You know, how do we push, um, you know, this much more YouTube traffic than we did last year? All these things. So there's a lot of work done there, and it, it can take it can take all sorts of forms. You know, um, in terms of ass assessing new devices for for your network, new topologies, all sorts of things. So other elements of the SRE mindset. So we've talked about kind of the core the core skill sets, the core things that SREs do. Um, but there's a few other things that are essential. So SRE career expectations. SREs expect to be able to be SREs for years and years and advance in their careers while working on production. So there's an anti-pattern that happened in software engineering in many, many organizations for years. You know, you'd, you'd, um, you'd, you'd, have, to, you'd have to go and um, you'd, you'd work as a software engineer for 10 years and then if you were good at it, you'd have to go off and become a software architect. And I think there's a similar passion that happens in networking, right? You work as a network operator for a while, and you know, then if you get to a certain point, you want to advance, you become a network architect or, or something like that. Um, SREs expect to be able to work on operations for a career and keep getting better at it and, and keep advancing in their careers. We also expect to spend time engineering. We don't, be expect, we don't expect to be working on, on sort of user tickets or, or things that don't improve our service all the time. So toil is something that we define as, you know, something that has to be done, but doesn't leave your, your service in a better state. So we, we try to limit that to under 50% of our time, so that we have 50% of time to, to work on S3 work, which doesn't have to be coding. It might be working on monitoring. It might be working on qualifying a, a, new, a new device into the network. It might be, you know, working on, say, networking policies, but it's going to be something that's engineering, not something that is, is not leaving your service better. So SREs are engineers, so there's a project focus rather than an ops focus. So this means that, like I say, we're not planning on working on tickets all day. So that means that we have to do a certain amount of project management that may be a little bit alien to some people. So that's things like, you know, having milestones and stand-up meetings and sort of doing quarterly planning of your work rather than just sort of day-to-day -day changing focus all the time um, based, on, based on what seems to be the highest priority right now. Um, you know, if, if you work like that, if you work, um, it's, if you're kind of driven to that because everything is on fire, then it's really hard to make progress on any substantial project over time. So that's something that we try and emphasize in SRE. We work on projects and we use project management techniques to get things done. Like I said before, we expect to have autonomy in deciding, relatively speaking, what's important. I mean, sometimes it's mandated that, you know, we have to work on a particular thing for a while because it's really important to the organization. But by and large, we don't expect, you know, our managers' managers to tell us that we need to work on this system rather than that system. We expect to be able to look at our system holistically ourselves and say, okay, this is costing us this much time, or this is affecting our ability to meet our SLO, or this is a risk. Um, so, we, we, so we think these three things are the highest priority. 
We also, like I say, one of the biggest things is we expect to have input into any planned changes in our system. And we expect to have the authority to say, no, this system is not good enough. We need to, we need to fix it before we can go into production. Um, which again can be, you know, very interesting when someone's always spent millions of uh, euros or dollars building it. But you know, this is and this is a thing that comes into, I think, a bit more tension between SRE and networks. Um, you know, in SRE, we tend to be dealing with software systems rather than something that has has had a lot of capital expenditure. Um, one of the key things here, I think, is that it's really important to get in and be involved in early design phases, not not just kind of come in at the end and go. I'm going to throw this system that's already built over the wall to you. That's that's not SRE. SRE is being there two years ahead of time when the planning is happening. So one final challenge to SRE. So apart from the complexity of how networks hang together and the interconnectedness, which is worse than software, and um, there's also because everything is so interconnected uh, in many ways, all networks are kind of this one giant failure domain things over here can affect things over there and it's really hard to stop it. So um, because, because it's so hard to abstract those, those, those different controlled parts of your network, the whole thing sort of becomes this, this whole thing that can fail, which is really interesting. So having said all that, um, why would we try and apply SRE principles to the network? You know, given that there are some things that are challenging, some things that don't work as well. well We'll, we'll, we're, we're trying to evolve our techniques to get better. We're trying to, you know, as SREs, we're learning more about networking. And, you know, as network engineers, they're learning more about SRE. Um, the fundamental reasons why we want to apply SRE principles are the same as for software systems. We want them to be more reliable. We want fewer outages. We want our outages to be, to be over faster. We want to learn from our outages. We don't want to spend a whole bunch of human time trying to trying to keep up with the things that need to change in our network and the things that break. You know, we want to be able to scale our network faster than we scale the teams that look after the network. So that, that is why SRE. So um, just before any questions, if there are any, I just want to give a couple of resources. So there is the SRE book, which is, I think it's something like six or 700 pages about how it is that we do SRE. So I'm sorry I didn't manage to get all of it into the half an hour talk, but there's a good bit there. Um, it is the full content is available free at that URL. So landing.google.com slash SRE slash book. You can also find it online if you search for the monitor lizard book because it is an animal book. And then, like I say, we have the SRE con conference taking place in Dublin this year from August 30th. So usenix.org, you'll find that. So um, I will be around for the next, well, until we get kicked out, um, if anybody does have any questions or if anybody wants to ask anything right now. And sorry for going over time as well. Yes, at the back there. <laughs> is there time for questions or? I'm uh, not sure there is one that's alive. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Oh yes, I'm alive. Okay, so I'll keep talking so you don't go away. Who's who's the gentleman who raised? Oh. <laughs> yes. So. Mine's more than network latency. I'll disconnect. Hi, I'm Keith. Um, when you talk about toil and the firefighting that you have to deal with, is that? Do you think that really is only? Uh, applicable to somewhere like Google or someone who has the resources to be able to deal with this kind of thing. It's, it's, not, it's not feasible for so many companies out there, right? Yeah, so I think small companies, um, so the question was, um, is, is the concept of reducing toil only applicable to large organizations? So it's certainly easier in large organizations to work on this um, because we have, we have economies of scale, right? So if we're having a problem 100 times a month, it's worth our time to take, you know, 30 or 40 hours automating that and hopefully it never bothers us again, right? In a smaller organization, you're going to have to be um, very deliberate about making sure that things that you choose to automate are going to pay you back. So if you have something that happens 10 times a month and costs you an hour, and that happens 10 times a month every month, 
um, you know, in the long term, you could you could spend some time automating that or and 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 save yourself time, or maybe you don't automate to the same degree. You know, maybe you automate so much that maybe you spend less time automating, but you automate away eighty percent of your instances, and now you've saved yourself you know four hours a week, or it's not too bad. You know, so you you can certainly reap some benefits of automation. You're not going to be able to automate everything. Does that help? Yeah. If you're talking about incident management and change management and that type of thing, yep. so many places there just aren't, there aren't enough people to do that. Um, I think even smaller places you st you still need incident management. Um, incident management is one of the things that does not require Google Scale to work. Incident management is really just you know somebody is defined as being the person in charge of this outage. Somebody is defined as being the person in charge of communication, and it might be the same person. And you're writing down what's happening. As, as you do it and what your current actions are and what the outcomes are. So it's mostly, incident management is mostly about having people with defined roles and having a, having a way to communicate between the people who are working on it and, and keeping track of what's going on. So, you know, something as simple as a shared document and an IRC channel is all that you need technically for incident management. And anytime that you're, you're dealing with more than one person trying to deal with an, with an outage or incident, you should probably have it. Um, because it's mostly about ma sharing state, making sure that things don't get missed. So even while um, while reducing toil by automation is is more difficult to do in small organizations, incident management is not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one more. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, does, does incident and change management in Google work well? Because I've never seen it work well anywhere. <laughs> does it work well? Um, so does incident management work well at Google and does change management work well at Google? Um, so, I mean, different teams are, are better at these skills than other teams. Um, I would say on average, yes, we are pretty good at incident management. Um, I mean, how, how long has Google.com been down in the last couple of years? You know, is it more than 10 minutes? I don't think it is. Um, so we are, that's, that's, Partly because we're, we're good at, um, at dealing with this kind of thing. Change management. Um, yeah, we break ourselves with our changes all the time, um, usually because we design our systems to be pretty highly redundant and, and good at recovering from that sort of thing. And because we canary our changes and we, and we check our canaries, we're pretty good at not breaking ourselves with our changes. But sometimes things do happen. So, you know. These things are all in a continuum. No organization anywhere is perfect at change management or incident management because these are these are human skills. You can automate your change management to to a large degree, but some part of it will always be human because there's always kind of weird edge cases and exceptions. So um, so we do, we do our best with it, and we're you know it's a human skill that we're constantly practicing. I spoke about doing the wheel of misfortune exercises, and partly that's about keeping incident management skills up up to date and sharp. And so is the disaster testing as well. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Rodrigo. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you lever, uh, uh, leverage your uh, um, involvement and responsibility in architectural decisions between the, the SRE and the, the team making the decisions, like uh, the network team, for example? Yeah, so I mean, this is something that we haven't been doing to such a large degree um, up until maybe a year or two ago, and but it's something that we're doing more now. Um, it's mostly a case of you, you want to be in at an early stage when, when things are being thought about, when there's going to be designs, so that you can try and spot what's going to be problems for, for operating it later on. So uh, th th this one is sort of hard to illustrate without examples that you're not allowed to talk about. So sorry about that. Can I? Can I... <laughs> uh, another question is, um, how, how big is the role of SRE in, in for example, uh, uh, helping a team uh, um, come up with the, what is the definition of done for that team? Uh, um, yeah, basically. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. What's the role of SRE in helping a team do something? Uh, to come up with 
what is the definition of done for that team? Um, I've never ever seen anything that was ever done. Um, <laughs> um, systems are always evolving and growing. I've never seen a software system that that didn't have bugs and didn't have a, a feature wish list. And you know, likewise, I've never seen a network that didn't need more capacity added somewhere and some things turned down and you know some 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 configs that weren't consistent everywhere. You know, system. This, I, I I don't think the system is ever done until you're about to turn it down. So, um, and I guess in terms of being ready to ship, that's not you know. One of the things that SREs don't do, and maybe I should have put that one on the slide, is SREs do not care about your features. Um, you know, your features are your business. We just care that the thing keeps running. So the only reason we might care about a feature in a software system is, is, is if it's a case we think this feature is dangerous in some way and might bring the system down. So I can give an example of that from a previous life, um, working in an, an e-commerce company and somebody launched a change to the mobile app that at a particular time um, every day would download a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm sure you can all see where this bit us horribly, right? Yeah, because you know, at 11.45 every day, the traffic would just go whoop, and you know, and everything would fall over. So SREs will only care about your features if, you're, if we think your features are going to break something. SREs are not about feature development, they're about reliability. Does that answer the question? Okay, absolutely. We'll talk after. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, we. I, th I think I'm going to get kicked off here in a second. Some of their three principles are really great, and I'd like to see more of them implemented in the network. Uh, question is, as you mentioned already, SREs are more dealing with software systems where you have. 10,000s of servers, and each server is pretty much the same. It may vary in number of CPUs, but uh, uh, network routers may be unique. Your router in Amsterdam is different to router in Frankfurt, different to router in Dublin, mm -hmm. and you cannot replace them one by one. So you are not dealing with like 10,000s of apples, but you're rather dealing an apple, a peer, something mm -hmm. else, and they even evolve, evolve over time. So yep. how well this applies to a network which is open, like so it's not closed system, like in software you control everything, it's open because like internet is open community and you don't control it. And uh, like your uh, building blocks are all different, like Lego, but like there is not a repeating block ever. So I think the question is, how do we deal with variation in our network and the fact that every device is important and special in some way? So yeah, in, in SRE, we have this saying that we, we want to treat our systems, um, and in particular, our machines and our running processes as cattle, not pets, meaning we don't give them special names and treat them differently. Like we expect to be able to, you know, turn this one down and turn this identical one up over here and, you know, nobody should notice. Um, as you say, it's different in the network. You know, every, every, every device in your network has a specific role. It's doing specific things. Like I say, um, if it's something in the backbone of your network, um, maybe you can turn it down without having a lot of impact. But if it's, if it's connected to a peer, yeah, they're going to have to notice that. So, um, but there are still things you can do. I mean, we, ha we have a lot of systems that basically do things like telling us, you know, when is the best time to do maintenance on this particular machine based on, you know, traffic and, you know, is it safe to, you know, do this change and also this other change over here at the same time, or is that going to cause problems? And in terms of the, the configs of your devices, um, you know, I would always recommend, it's a very good idea to, you know, take those and store them in source control somewhere like, every, like everything else. You, the last thing you want is all the config related to a, to a particular router living only on that router because if you have to replace it, then you're, you're going to be in, in bad shape. So does that help? But yes, it's harder for sure. Like routers are, are unfortunately, they have unfortunate pet-like properties. It, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's not quite like they're cattle and pets. It's more like with routers, it's kind of like a petting zoo or something, you know. So we're, we're a halfway house. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Laura. Oh. All right. With this, hello.
cooperate, please? No? Okay. Right. Okay. So we've reached the end of our presentation session. Uh, thank you all for coming again. Uh, this is the part where I say a lot of thank yous, right? So bear with me. Um, it's really good to see so many of you, and this is, you know, the the first our first INOC for uh, 2017. Uh, huh? yeah. um, so first of all, I wanted to say uh, now that the image is here. Right. For a long time, we kind of wanted to have a bit of Inox swag, right? And to have something that has the Inox name on it and sort of rep represents uh, some of our values. Now, we didn't really know where to get such a thing because, uh, you know, the best I could do was come up with a with an Inox logo that has three colors in it and just that. Which is good in itself, and it looks quite awesome on on the on the on the Google screens, by the way. So thank you very much, uh, Shane, for 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 putting those up. Um, but we were quite lucky to discover that we actually have someone with actual, uh, you know, artistic skills in in our community, and I'm sure there's more of you hiding in there. Um, so a big big shout out goes out to Barry Keegan. So please give him a big round of applause. So he's done an amazing job uh, also at being patient with myself and Donald's feedback repeatedly. This is the second version of, of the sticker uh, with, with a few very good, uh, you know, a bit of advice from, from a few of other, our other members of the community. Uh, so I would like to introduce to you uh, Bash Bunny and Fiber Fox. <laughs> Obviously, they, they are under the watchful eye of our uh, iNog mastermind uh, automation robot, which is a fusion of Rosie, if some of you actually remember the Jetsons, and um, uh, some other robot, which I have no idea where it came. But anyway, um, so Obviously, this needs to. Uh, the, the message we're trying to send with this is uh, that of inclusion, of diversity, uh, of creating a community that accepts everyone, uh, that actually enjoys network engineering, regardless of any of their, you know, affiliations or interests. Uh, aside from that, so it's it's something that you've heard in you hear every time in our code of conduct, and I'm happy to say that. Uh, We've had a very positive vibe every every time after every meeting from from everyone in the community, and I would like to to have another round of applause for everybody that is INOG actually for for upholding these principles and being part of it. Thank you. Um, we still have a few of these stickers um, available, so I will put them on the table over there. Uh, so if you haven't grabbed any when you when you came in, you're you're welcome to come and grab a couple. Uh, please be considerate of others and uh, just grab a couple because we have a limited initial run right now. Um, where is he? So we're looking for somebody who needs to come over here. So we're we're in the thanking business right now and you know I know it wouldn't be possible without all, all of the wonderful hosts that actually help us have this these events uh, Google has been really nice to us and a very good friend and they've hosted us two times now and actually every every time the, the first one and the second one have been made possible 90% I would say through the hard work of, of Shane here so please a big round of applause for him Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's your, your two seconds of fame. <laughs> um, so as usual, uh, if you would like to host INOG, uh, if you'd like to, to, to sponsor or provide any help 
to our community, be it drinks or be it hosting a meeting or getting involved in creating artwork, logos, designs, you name it, we'll find something for you if you want to help. Please get in touch with myself, with Donal, with basically uh, anyone that you know through the Meetup page. We're watching Meetup, we're watching Slack, so there's we're watching Twitter. So there's plenty of ways uh, of, of finding us if you if you would like to contribute in any way. Um, we don't have a specific date and location for the next Tynog, but I think it's safe to say that it's going to be somewhere where they're about in June. Uh, you will receive announcements through Meetup very soon, I would say, with, with the confirmation of the exact date. Um, if you have something to share with the community, uh, a talk, please get in touch. Uh, we're looking for talks. We're going to have three more meetings this year. Uh, it, you don't have to necessarily schedule something for the next one, but if you have something that you'd like to share, a talk, a demo, anything uh, technical, non-technical, of relevance to the community, please get in touch with us uh, and, and we'll, we'll see what it can do. Um, again, I would say another th big thank you for Barry for volunteering his time and creating Bash Bunny and Fiberfox. Um, and thank you all for coming and I wish you a, a very nice week, uh, rest of the evening socializing and having a bit of more beer. Thank you. Oh, and many thanks to our presenters. I almost forgot it. I, I had it here. I had it here, but Jesus. Yeah, so, so thank you, Costi. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Victor. You're great. Uh, Barry. Barry. Oh, shit. Oh. <clears throat> Pardon my French. Thank you, Barry. I, I'm, I'm bad at counting after a couple of beers. Sorry. <laughs>